This video is brought to you by ASRock and the new Razer edition of the Tai Chi B550. Now, if you're looking at AM4 for your next build, B550 is a good choice. It's got lots of features, 16 power phases. It's got all the power delivery you could need from the 5950X all the way down to the uh, 3600X. This motherboard has lots of rear connectivity, including lots of USB 3, 5 gigabit, and 10 gigabit, only two USB 2 ports. We've got the Type C, we've got the killer NIC and the killer Wi Fi. So you've got, you know, killer networking for uh, that for your gaming if you're if you're looking for that. We've also got PCI Express 4, PCI Express 4 across the board. Uh, you got the reinforced slots and all the connectivity here that you could ever need. You got two 30 pin connectors, you got the 10 gigabit Type C for your front panel connection. And you've got Razer's software, that's Synapse 3, built right into the motherboard. So the motherboard goes with all of your Razer RGB accessories. Whatever you're looking to do for your build, chances are this board is going to support it. And be sure to check out the Razer edition of the B550 Tai Chi Razer. Thanks, Azrock, and on with the video. It's time for the ultimate grudge match in wireless technology. I don't know about Ultimate Grudge Match. This is actually really tricky. If you follow the channel at all, you know that I've recently reviewed, uh, you know, a bevy of gear from Ingenious. And I've been a long, super long, long time user of Ubiquity access points and gear. I mean, I'm a pro user. It's a different use case than a pure commercial use or campus use or something like that where you usually go for density, meaning that you have a lot of wireless clients and not a lot of access points. As an early adopter, I've got a lot of wireless devices. Everything from computers to laptops. Sure, yeah, that's fine. But even my home automation system is wireless and my kitchen lighting and the alarm panel, parts of it. I mean, even before wireless mesh networks were a thing, I was picking up used and refurbished, you know, Cisco gear way back in the day because it was way better than anything that you could get commercially. I mean, all of the consumer stuff was basically crap. It was all the same. It was all terrible. It's like, oh, let me flash DDWRT on this piece of garbage. It's still a piece of garbage. Consumer crap is just crap. But you know, the Cisco stuff you're gonna buy new is insanely expensive. Ubiquity was the first real contender to attack that middle of the market. It's more expensive than the cheap stuff, but it's almost as good, but not quite as good as the more expensive stuff. And over the last 10 years, Ubiquity has really taken over the universe. But, you know, they've had some missteps. Uh, certain models that would overheat and be weird. I've lamented about bad botched firmware upgrades on this channel and other podcasts. It's just occasionally not a pleasant experience. That led me to seek out other brands. And Ingenious is one such brand where their models sort of caught me by surprise with how good they were, at least the new ones. Wi-Fi 6 AX, you know, something I'm still kind of waiting on Ubiquity for to, to do really well and stellar performance. We'll talk more about that in a second. Well. Uh, it's time for that longer term ingenious evaluation and my thoughts and benchmark tests, not just against Ubiquity, but also go the Cisco C911115 uh, uh, and the Meraki MR55, which is an 8x8 solution. That's a, whoo, yeah. It's kind of like the commercial equivalent of that Asus spider router thing, except it's actually commercial grade and not basically still residential grade. So a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about is kind of subjective. It's kind of just my own personal experience, but don't worry, I have real world-ish benchmarks or at least benchmarks that I could control. Thanks to some of our patrons, they also bought the bullet and picked up some gear to retrofit their homes and offices. And I can include some of their thoughts and their perspectives in this video. So I'll sort of weave that in with the stuff that I'm gonna talk about. So first, let's talk about features. Now, a lot of this I've already covered in our prior videos, so check those out for more info. But here's where we are, here's where we landed, basically. With setups like the Meraki setups, it is extremely nice, killer in fact. It's decent hardware, but the software can really be hit and miss. A lot of the time they'll finish the hardware and then rush it out before the software is really done. You gotta basically pay for a subscription or your network stops working in order to get updated software in about the middle of the device life cycles when it's really good. I mean, well, okay, your network will kind of keep working, but things like client handoff and roaming, those suddenly stop working and other things suddenly stop working. So this subscription, it slowly bleeds you dry. And as wireless clients evolve and software changes, you know, people do need to be paid to keep working on software updates for these access points. On the one hand, the initial software from day one for Meraki really isn't the best. So maybe you're not getting what you pay for from day one. 
I don't really know what to think about the subscription model. Instinctually, I think the in subscription model is not good, but I could kind of see the argument that, well, things change and you need to keep paying the programmers. Now, Ubiquity uses the same equipment for cloud managed via cloud key device uh, or on premises managed. And there is no subscription, and the devices are usually a little bit better than half baked when they're first released. But it can be hit and miss. For example, those Android VoIP phones that I always love to go to, those basically represent an abject failure of ubiquity. You know, it's like, hey, we're gonna do Android phones and it's gonna be this great VoIP system. I can see the dream, no follow through. Another more recent example of that is, and there was supposed to be a warranty, and if you look at the product listing, it seems to imply that there's a manufacturer's warranty, but Ubiquity says no. No, this is a third party seller, so you don't get any warranty. So they would not honor the warranty to deal with that. But you know, there's still third party sellers that Ubiquity is not shutting down on Amazon, so be sure that you understand what that means for your warranty. I expect Ubiquity to do better. Now to be sure, Ubiquity is not at feature parity with Meraki. Meraki has way more stuff. And in Genius, well, they're not at feature parity with Ubiquity. There are several features and integration that Ubiquity has that I wish Ingenious had. For one, it's trivial to run a management app locally versus in the cloud with Ubiquity. Same hardware, same configuration, it just finds it on the network. With Ingenious, you can do that, but you gotta get access points and other hardware that has different firmware that's designed for local management. Now, Ingenious supports all the common things that I wanted to do though. So it's not like you're really short on features. Things like guest networks with a captive portal, no problem. The take you to a default webpage, which is great if you wanna show guests your network local resources. Everything from, hey, you can print to these printers. Here's the Plex Media server. Here's some links to some other internal resources. You can do all that with a captive portal. It works great on Ingenious. Multiple SSIDs that map to different VLANs. That's also really well supported. I tested the security of that as best I could. It seems to be pretty robust. You can also do mix uh, mix of uh, WPA Enterprise and WPA authentication. So you can, for example, have per user encryption keys on your wireless network, which is pretty awesome. They support external systolic servers, radius servers for authentication, Mac filtering, client rate limiting, quality of service, so on and so forth. That's really nice. Those are It's good to see that. For me, the killer features were good wireless handoff and good 802.11ax support. And nothing really compares to that, especially with their like three x three and four x four solutions. As I decided to put them to the test, I thought it would be like, hey, let's just benchmark them. So introducing my walk-in Faraday cage. Now there's a story behind this and that's gonna have to be in another video, but I have a walk-in Faraday cage basically. This is an all metal bunker. It's a cozy out of the way place and it's ideal for doing wireless testing. It's just over 100 feet long and the metal walls and ceiling and foil lined floor means that there are no stray radio waves. There's not even cell phone coverage in here because well, it's basically a metal Faraday cage, which is kind of nuts. So for the tests, I set up a basic file server, 10 gigabit in our 10 gigabit ingenious switch, iperf3 for the clients that support it, and I did some other informal testing. For the wireless clients, I used a bunch of different things. I used an Apple iPhone, a last gen iPad Pro, a Microsoft Surface, some other clients with the Intel Wi-Fi 6 adapter, and so on and so forth. I tested it with a Galaxy S9 Plus Android phone and several other you know, sort of portable battery operated clients like that. The numbers that I'm about to show you are the best numbers out of five runs. So I also um, tested with the ASRock Razer motherboard that has the killer wireless NICs, which is also Wi-Fi 6, and it was not horribly broken. It was, it was decent, it wasn't as fast as the other stuff I'm about to show you, so I'm just gonna leave that out. It's not part of our benchmark numbers, but just so you know, I tested something other than the Intel client. Now testing here is a little bit of a pain in the I'm not gonna really get super deep into the reasons, but I tried to test with both Wi-Fi 5 and Wi-Fi 6. That's 802.11ac and 802.11ax. Uh, I tried to make sure that we always used both bands as well, 2.4 gigahertz and five gigahertz. So here we are. Now, if you look at this, we've got our Cisco Catalyst switch and our Meraki, that's kind of the baseline performance here. Uh, Ruckus, Ubiquity, and uh, you know our actual ingenious access point. The Apple devices do really well pretty much across the board. Overall, the ingenious device is fast, although in some cases it really just ekes out a very, very small uh, win, a very small margin. But remember, the Ubiquiti AC HD is not technically 802.11ax. So it's a little bit of a speed disadvantage there. And we'll talk more about the uh, ACHD light in a second. Now, you need to take these results with a bit of a grain of salt 
because there are a lot of variables in here. Clients may not support or want to use both 2.4 gigahertz and five gigahertz at the same time. The roaming and handoff can also affect throughput as the client is trying to use one radio on the wireless network card to probe and see if other access points are available while the, you know, another radio is busy. So it's really hard to set up a test protocol where the results were consistent within a few percentage points across a series of runs. There's also the channel width setting, which I tried to set to 80 megahertz everywhere that I could. A lot of the time out of the box, these devices are gonna be configured for 20 or 40 megahertz channel width, which is gonna hurt your throughput testing. I also wanted to include the Unify Wi-Fi 6 Lite for this comparison. That's only a two by two solution, but I had trouble keeping it going. It kept wanting to go to the 2.4 gigahertz band and stay out of the five gigahertz band, which is kind of crap. Uh, when it did work, I could get it to 810 megabit for the Apple devices, which is not bad, still slower than the Ingenious, but disabling the 2.4 gigahertz band to try to force it into five gigahertz made it worse. So I'm gonna have to revisit that in the future because this video has already been far too long in the making. The Meraki, as I said before, it's an eight by eight device. And so I'll just point that out because that's ridiculous. Obviously it's meant for density, not speed, because the speed here isn't great. So perhaps, these classes, this class of device is less desirable than it once was because it's not a speed demon, but I'm sure that you can pack on a lot more devices than these other devices. In any case, I look forward to doing a lot more of this kind of testing if you wanna see it. It's clear that in Ingenius's partnership with uh, Cineo, I think that's how you say it, the Taiwanese company, uh, it's a communications company, uh, so far has produced really solid, reliable hardware. There may yet be more disruption here uh, you know, the way that the old guard like Cisco was previously disrupted. I really think they're onto something because the hardware, the hardware really is solid. And the places where I've had trouble has been more on the software side. Once I've gotten them set up, I, there's not really any complaints that I have. And I'm sure if you watch the older videos, it's like, well, I had to jump through some hoops to get the ingenious stuff set up. But for all of the features that I've tried and the management portal and, and all of that kind of stuff, it's been solid and reliable, you know, kind of impressively so, like more more than I expected. I uh, also didn't expect the, the ingenious access points to perform as well as they did versus the other access points. Of course, I did expect to include the, the a, uh, Ubiquiti AC6 Lite, the Lite access point that's Wi-Fi 6, it's a two by two solution. I don't know what the deal was there. I went through a couple of different firmwares. We're just, I'm gonna have to revisit that. I don't, something wasn't right there. And I don't want to, I mean, 810 megabits, not bad, but I don't want to publish those numbers because um, it needs a little work. And I, I don't think that they're going to be bad. Uh, I, don't, I don't, I think they're, they're probably going to be okay, but I gotta, I gotta come back to that. I don't know what was going on with that. Uh, the takeaway here is that for the money, these are really impressive devices that have a lot of the features that you're looking for. And so far for me, they've been really solid, especially with 802.11 AX, especially with client handoff, especially with packing in a ton of devices in both like a small office and you know residential stereo. So I'm Wendell, this is level one. Be sure to check out that performance table. It's not bad. Didn't talk about some of the edge case parameters, but hey, maybe something we can revisit in the future. I'm Wendell, this is level one. I'm signing out. I'll see you later.